talk to you about the best arguments for street fighters. And that's what, this is what we can bring to the debate. Your speaker this morning, Mark, he's an intellectual and he has an incredible ability to translate that so you can understand it. But you guys are going to be sending people in to vote who just fall for those little euphemisms that run around out there, and we're the ones that can dispel that. We can talk tough. We can rip those arguments apart. And we may have to say some things we don't like to say. But I, I think you're going to be on board with me that we got to do it. So here, let's just go through some of the myths. It's about pain and suffering. We don't let our animals <coughs> suffer. Why would we let our loved ones? Well, Wesley Smith has it, and this, is, this one really gets to me, because this one almost makes us feel like we're not very nice people and we let people suffer. And this resonates probably with the public more than anything else. Wesley Smith is fabulous at this. Do you guys know Wesley? Yeah. He, he does a great job of walking through how, it's always, how he's treated his animal different than his family members since the day they got the, the dog. He loves his dog. But he says, you know, I didn't keep his brothers and sisters. We don't go to family reunions. I've made decisions for my dog ever since he was he came to us. I have to decide how much to feed him and what he needs for care. And at the end of his days, he can't communicate with me. And he certainly can't make a written request, right? So, so he, he walks through, and I think that's very important. But I decided before I came down here to go visit my vet. And I have a, a very old dog. He's 15 years old. He's on pain medication for arthritis. His hearing is going, and she, my, my vet and I were discussing it. His eyesight is going, and, and, and he's just really old. So I said, so I have a question for you. Would you send me home with a lethal dose for my dog? She said, absolutely not. Right? Absolutely not. And she came right out with reason. She said, I would be, it would be irresponsible. She said, what if a child got a hold of that medication? I would be responsible. She said, what if it didn't go well? What if it didn't die? She said, you have two choices. I come to your house or you come here. And she goes, there's a lot we do for an animal. We give them muscle relaxants and we do a lot of things to make sure this goes well. I said, oh really? So in fact, we treat our animals better than we treat our family members, apparently. So don't let them get away with it. It's just not true. We don't do it. To, we do not send owners of pets home with a lethal dose. We don't do it. Now, you'd be good if, if you called your vet and got that personally if you have one, just so you could say my vet. But these are the kind of things that you should call the radio shows about and bring it up and knock their arguments down because you need to educate your radio talk show hosts and you need to educate the media. And you gotta be fighters and they gotta know that you're fighting. Um, this is the one that I think is toughest too in Vermont. We're a choice state. Anytime you can use the choice state, choice word, Vermonters want it. They want choices. I want to make my, ch I want to, oh, that's a good sentence. Uh, <laughs> I want to choose the time and manner of my death without interference from government and, the, and those who have religious beliefs. So this was a hard one and we just had to hit it because there are no laws against suicide on, in, on the books in any state in the United States of America. And as one doctor said in his testimony, sadly, our emergency rooms are full of the people who have decided to take their own lives and done it successfully. Really and truly, it's sad but true. And you can Google suicide. I'm not encouraging anyone to commit suicide. And this is tough for pro-lifers. But we got to knock out their arguments. They have the right to choose to commit suicide. Not a right so much, but they can. Let's say they can. Um, and if you Google suicide on the internet, you're going to get about 150 ways to commit suicide. Um, this was a big turning point for us. This fellow is a former U.S. Congressman, uh, Senator Dick Mallory, very beloved Vermonter, always been in favor of assisted suicide. He was in all the commercials that ran ad nauseum on TV, that he wanted this choice before the end of his days. And he got cancer, and the bill was just not passed in time for him, so he committed suicide. Now this caused, they, they put things in all the boxes in the legislature and it caused significant alarm among our supporters in the state house. And Senator John Campbell came to me and he said, Mary, and he had a group with them of ones on our side, he said, Mary, what are we gonna do about this? And I said, John, Senator Mallory has just shown us that you can do it and you don't need a law and you don't need a doctor. And that just turned, it turned everything around. I know 
that as the right to life her, I sort of gave some permission there, but we've got to win this battle. We've got to win this battle. Because more people will be at risk if the bill passes than anything I say. Um, so anyway, this is the other myth that just has to be dispelled. And this is, I want a pill to end my, oh, a me end my life. I'm really doing well with my grammar here. Um, so the myth is that it's one magic pill. Now, a lethal dose involves about 90 pills. So you're looking at about maybe 25 or 30. You only got about 60 left to swallow if you can get all those down. And that's a debate changer as well. So, and then they're going to go on to tell you that, oh, yeah, 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 but now it's all wonderful. They can open the capsules up and stir it up into applesauce. And this, remember, weird with capital letters, we were, in the, we were in a committee of the House in 2007, and I sent my gal in. Now, she didn't testify as Vermont Right to Life. She's, she's on our board of directors, but she has a daughter with Down syndrome, so she testified on her own. But she said, I want to start by saying, it involves, this involves 90 pills. And the room went, ugh. And then Dick Walters, president, says, oh, yes, but you can open the capsules up and mix it in applesauce. And the whole room of pro of, of pro suicide supporters went, ooh, these people are weird. They can't wait to take the pills. Now the other thing that they said, which was very revealing, was you you can open up the capsules and help someone eat it. So so much for self-administer. Once those pills are out of the bottle, it's going to be easier to put it in grandma's applesauce and help her eat it. Now, another big one is everything is working well in Oregon. That is so not true. Um, of course, the suicide rate is rising in Oregon. We were able to really capitalize on that as the suicide rate in Vermont has gone up 13% in the last two years. And it's a big problem for Vermont. And it's a lot of teen suicides. And we were able to super capitalize on that with a mother who had formerly been a legislator and formerly in favor of this bill, only her 19-year-old son committed suicide. And she tearfully testified that the message you send, that it's about choice and that it's about people who are terminally ill, is not always the message that is received. She asked me also not to use the word commit suicide because that implies rationality and someone who commits suicide is not rational. And I said, how would you have me phrase that? She said, someone who has taken their own life. But she, um, and then there was another fellow who's a lobbyist at the state house. He's pro-life, but nobody knows that either. But his son has been in counseling for suicide against not to commit suicide for years and years and years. And he stumbled across the testimony that, that these people were trying to legalize this. And he was furious. He said, you've been telling me all my life, Dad, that I can't, I can't take my own life, that there's always a reason to live, and they're trying to legalize it for some people, and that was a child who had to go back into counseling. So that, that resonates. Um, I want to tell you about some of the cases of abuse. <clears throat> but they'll come and they'll say, oh, everything's working wonderful in Oregon. We only have family members who want to keep their family members alive. And we're like, oh, really? In Vermont, there are 300 cases of, of unaddressed abuse. They have been um, uninvestigated abuse of the elderly. There's a backlog. So I guess we just don't take as good care of our elderly as they do in Oregon. But uh, don't believe it. And so we say, meet Kate Cheney, meet Pat Matheny, meet Barbara Wagner and Randy Stroop. Randy Stroop and Barbara Wagner are in your packet, so I'm going to skip them. But these cases go a bit further back. And so what we did with the legislators was, legislators was we put these in their mail. They have boxes in this Vermont State House. They pick up their mail every day. And so we had a different color postcard with another story of abuse. And it was, we had 10 days worth. God was good. The day we ran out was the day of the vote. Um, so I think they thought there were more coming. So Kate Cheney, are you familiar with it? Because I can skip this. Do you know about Kate Cheney in Oregon? OK, she was 85 years old. She had terminal cancer. and. Um, she told her doctor that she wanted assisted suicide. Concerned that she didn't meet the requirement for mental competence because of some dementia, the first physician declined. Um, the second physician declined. And one wrote in her, the psychiatrist wrote in his report that while the assisted suicide seemed consistent with Kate's values, she did not seem to be explicitly pushing for this. He also determined that she did not have a very high capacity to weigh options. 
However, the daughter seemed to be highly interested in her rece receiving the uh, lethal prescription. Um, let me. Uh, in the end, they found a doctor who would prescribe uh, Kate Cheney a lethal dose. Um, now, one of the things you have to realize, remember it's the same enemy? If you stop a kid in Vermont, anyway, and say, where do you get an abortion around here? They're going to go Planned Parenthood, right? So you have to understand that anything they say is a safeguard, all that's going to be gone. They're going to say, where do you find the pills? And they're going to point you right directly to the people who always just write the prescription. It's just going to happen that way. I mean, they're the same people, they're the same philosophy. If they really think that you have a right to have the pills, then really they don't really believe you should have to jump through all the hoops. So if there's a first doctor and then a second doctor and then a psychiatrist, they'll just team up. Um, 62 doctors in Oregon wrote 114 prescriptions in that state last year, with some writing up to 14 prescriptions each. So you see, it's just a small 1% of doctors are writing the prescriptions, and you just find out how to get them. Um, so anyway, Kate, Kate went home. The psychologist was worried about familiar pressures. That was in her file, maybe influenced by family's wishes. Uh, it, it, to make sure that Kate did what she was supposed to do, the family put her in a nursing home for a week. And when she came out, she dutifully took the pills. So we call it uh, Oregon's Death with Dignity, Abused and Exploited. And we talk about how the Oregon Department of Health itself says we can't determine if physician-assisted suicide is being practiced outside the framework of the law. It's just they're not, they haven't been given the funds, they don't have the resources to actually check on all of this. So it's, it's whatever is happening is happening. And don't, do not let them say it's all working well in Oregon. Patrick Matheny, this is a really horrible story. He was 43 years old, he had Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, he wanted to end his life. He got. He was eligible for the uh, for the prescription on on March of 1999. Matheny tried to swallow the barbiturates mixed into a chocolate nutrition drink sweetened with a box full of sugar substitute. Reportedly, he had experienced a difficulty swallowing the concoction. The only person Matheny had asked to be with him in his trailer was his brother-in-law, Joe Hayes. Hayes told the Oregonian newspaper that he had to help Matheny to die, but would not say how. According to Hayes, it was too personal. Quote, it doesn't go smoothly for everyone, Hayes explained. For Pat, it was a huge problem. It would not have worked without help. Um, Michael Freeland is another case. He received a, a lethal prescription. Um, <laughs> uh, a, a year after receiving his first prescription, he was admitted, admitted to a psychiatric treatment facility. Now, a year after, remember the six-month limit? So, because he was experiencing depression and suicidal intent. He was treated and improved. His professional caregivers ensured that his 32 guns and all of his ammunition were removed from his home before he was allowed to return, but they knowingly allowed him to keep his lethal prescription. His, his treating psychiatrist wrote a letter to the court the day after his discharge saying he was not competent and needed a guardian. Mr. Freeland called physicians for compassionate care. He called them accidentally because he was looking for compassion in dying. Our friends in, in Oregon have deliberately kept the name very similar, compassionate care, compassionate in dying, so that some people will call them by mistake. They helped him through the last several months of his life, saw that his depression and his symptoms were treated aggressively, and assisted in him in reconciling with his estranged daughter. He died natu naturally and comfortably nearly two years after receiving his first lethal prescription. Okay, there's, then there's David Pruitt, a man from Oregon with lung cancer. Came from a physician, the standard lethal prescription, and when it felt it was time, he took the entire amount. He went to sleep for 65 hours and woke up saying, what the hell happened? <laughs> Why am I not dead? He was so unnerved by the experience that he didn't want to go through it again. He died naturally about two weeks later. Um, there, in, in this last round of, of information out of Oregon, there is one person at least who is still alive 872 days after being uh, given the prescription. So that's almost three years of wrong on a diagnosis. And, and there's more. We have, we have a good 10 cases of abuse. I, I don't think you need them all, but I think whenever you can humanize it like that, when you can put a name on it, and you can document it that it came from a newspaper, because that's the only way you're going to get it in Oregon. Now, see, they're getting better, so you need these cases of abuse, because now the, the pro-assisted suicide folks try to be there and make sure it all goes well. 
Um, and who knows what they're doing? That's a really frightening thought because a number of cases, they, they will not be able to assimilate those pills before, as my vet was concerned about, before they're either vomiting it back up or in, in a coma and it doesn't go well. So now they're getting there to make sure it goes well, it doesn't get into the newspaper. So these old cases of abuse are probably all we are going to have. I also have a, um, Ken Stevens is a huge resource from Oregon and we have lessons from Oregon and he narrates that if you need anything. So uh, I think I've really kind of passed my time, aren't I? You guys need me to be done? No, you have a couple more minutes. Okay, um, the ch what the churches can do, we've talked about some of that. Energizing their base. I'm, I'm really hoping if there's any way to get into the prayer of the faithful and, or any of the prayers in the evangelical churches so that daily, at least weekly, parishioners are reminded that um, this is coming on November 6th. Um, these, all these things, the only, the only other suggestions I have is that we ban the talk radio stations. And you guys have some great rock, rock, talk radio stations, right? Yeah. I mean, go for it. Don't wait till they have guests on. Say, you know, this ballot initiative, just, just be a street fighter. Go ahead and say, gosh, you guys got to know this is dangerous. Um, dangerous and risky. And then what we do is we double team. And you know, there's not that many of us in Vermont. So my office assistant's name is Brenda. She calls herself Georgia. I change my name. We use our cell phones and we just do it ourselves. We just call. And we need to get these people to plant the seeds in their minds because they're the ones who will then be talking it out there and raising doubts. Um, and and we, we also infiltrated the other side. So, like I said before, more of us showed up at all their meetings than their own supporters did. Um, you got to get on their mailing list, and, and you won't believe how funny some of the stuff is they write. It's just ridiculous. So, um, get on their mailing list, get on their social media, make sure you know where they're going to be, um, and, and just keep an eye on everything. But call those radio shows, they're a resource. Uh, we had. Um, Oh, and this is just another, I want you to know how everybody cooperated. At one point, the Catholic Diocese was going to do a postcard campaign to the legislators. A Catholic postcard campaign. <laughs> I was like, no. So I called up, and they canceled it. And that's the kind of spirit of cooperation you need. No egos. No egos. You've got to go, 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 and do what's best. The Catholics, at, and the Catholics and the Christians need to get their own people to the ballot box, but they need to get put on your street fighter mode uh, and go out and fight and use the terminology that works. Know that you're doing it for God. Know that people are going to die who didn't want to die if this bill is passed. And people are going to die who might otherwise have lived. It's the most serious thing that we face. Um, so I said that already. We, we um, always were talking about the out-of-state money um, and, and making them look like they were trying to buy Vermont. Vermont hates that. They love choice a whole lot, but they hate it when someone comes in and tries to buy the state. I'm sure Massachusetts is the same way. We got a new resource, this True Dignity Vermont allowed pro-lifers to work under the banner of True Dignity. So all of our, all the letters were a, 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 compiled there, it became a resource for reporters. It was just the biggest blessing. These people, just two or three people put that site up and then they man it every day. Uh, oh, anyway, we needed to do some quick change-ups before the 2012 because we knew there'd be payback for the money they wanted they would want the death of dignity folks to feel they had done something so we did do a public opinion poll and our arguments work so with four debate blocks using some of the arguments the street fighter arguments we were able to drop support for physician assisted suicide doctor prescribed suicide in vermont by 10 percentage points